Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to the Melting Pot, South African Elections and Policy Series 2024. We started the Melting Pot with hosting the CEO of the IEC. We went, we went on to host other political parties, Rise Mzansi, BOSA, and UDM. Today, we are hosting the Economic Freedom Fighters, we are sitting with the CIC, Julius Malema. I will give Sam an opportunity to introduce uh, uh, the CIC, and then we can get into, into the discussion. Sam? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Isaiah. I don't think I'll, I'll probably fail at get an F if I try to introduce the CIC. And, <laughs> and everybody knows him, uh, and especially uh, in this uh, uh, public uh, audience and people who follow uh, South African uh, politics, uh, former president of the Youth League, uh, started uh, founding uh, president of the EFF, uh, one of the biggest parties uh, in South Africa, very interesting in the context of the uh, coming uh, elections. And good afternoon, uh, Mr. President. Afternoon, afternoon. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. The reason why we are hosting a political series is because this election is potentially quite important given that it might result in coalition governments. And that will uh, necessitate um, some change in, policy, in policies which has impact on markets, which have impact in terms of how the economy performs. So we are looking to get your ideas as far as what you are going to bring into the coalition partners at national level given that you are already in um, some municipalities and metros and coalitions. What are you looking to, to bring from a, an economic performance perspective? Who are you willing to go into coalitions with? What are your conditions? So that investors that are on the line, they can get informed in terms of what they are likely to face as they deploy their capital in the, in the economy. For the investors that are on the line, on the bottom right, you have a Q&A. Please do post all your questions there so that we can post them to Mr. Julius Malema. And for the audience in, in person sitting here, we are recording this, so please just uh, bear in mind uh, that we are recording in terms of the conversation so that we, we are audible for those that are online. Maybe as a start, you can give us a brief synopsis of your manifesto, what you are telling your voters or your prospective voters before we go into the discussion about your policies. Thank you very much. Um, I thought I was going to speak to the computer. I didn't know there were people who were, <laughs> were going to be sitting in front of me. So when it was explained was that it's like a Zoom and uh, so, but uh, thank you for once more uh, receiving the EFF. I said to my brother, uh, we may not be friends with RMB or any of the capitalist institution, but we coexist in the same environment and we ought to understand one another. Uh, because our ideological differences shouldn't mean enmity. Uh, so we don't see um, RMB, whatever other financial institution as an enemy, we see them as institutions that need to be transformed. Our policies are very simple. Our, our battle cry is land, jobs, and stop load shedding. So we seek to expropriate land and uh, without compensation because the land was never compensated when it was taken. And someone says, no, don't scare investors, but even investors are scared of the truth. They can run. The reality is this land was stolen through the wars of dispossession and people were killed. And the only way to reverse that pain is to restore the land back into the hands of the people. What happens to these beautiful buildings that are on top of this land? They remain RMB buildings, but this is our land. They should know that they are building us is sitting on top of our land. And it had, if they decide to do anything on this land, which is not in line with what they occupied the land for. They should seek permission from the state. If they no longer have any use for this land, 
they should report so to the state so that it can be reallocated to an alternative person who will put this land to use. This will not be done through the army. It will be done through constitutional consultation because our constitution allows amendments. So if you do, because if all of you, when you argue, you say, follow the constitution. We've got the best constitution in the world. But when we follow the constitution and amend it, it is a problem when it's not favorable. So we want all of the land to be in the hands of the state so that when the state wants to make an allocation, there is no difficulty. Today, everything else is cheap except the land. It might be very expensive to buy this land and very cheap to build this beautiful building. Why should it be? The land must be available to those who are going to use it and those who don't use it, they must lose it. Someone says foreign direct investment does not invest where it doesn't own the land. It's not true. All economy, special economic development zones in South Africa, the land is owned by government and foreign investment put its investment on the land that is owned by government. So it shouldn't be inconsistent argument that no, when the state owns the land, the people will not invest on that land when they are investing on it now. If there is any economic development happening in any big economic development zones, go and check the ownership of that land. It's a state-owned land. We need to do jobs. You cannot do jobs without industrialization. We need to industrialize. Even the Bantu stem, the smallest states of black people during apartheid, they had factories. There is no single Bantu stem leader be it Mangope, be it Nsangwesi, be it uh, 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 whatever, including Wuteles. Uh, uh, All of them, if you go into their areas, they are industrial sites during apartheid by Bantu state government. Tell me now of any industrialization that has been state-led, and then we complain about jobs. Very rich in minerals. All those minerals are extracted from our land and they are put on top of a truck to uh, reach us bay. When you look at that, you say, no, it's chrome. It's not chrome. It's jobs in a truck transported to China to go and do job creation in China. Because that chrome went processed here. We don't even clean it here. So when processed here, you can imagine how many jobs can be done. So we need state ownership of uh, the mines. So when we say nationalization of the mines, we don't mean we're going to take a mine of national, of uh, Anglo-American and nationalize it. We mean the state must have its own mining company, which will be given preference, especially on profitable minerals. Let's go to Mokopani, for instance, the platinum in Mokopani. Anglo-American is no longer mining. When it gets mining rights, it outsources the mining to other companies. But Mokopani, they are mining it themselves directly. Why? The platinum is just here. It's the most profitable mine of platinum. And that, if was owned by the state, how many jobs were we going to create with that money of that platinum alone? How many social responsibilities can we attend to with that money alone? How do we do that? The state is not driven by profit. The state, with its money, is able to reinvest in the social well-being of our people. Let's take diamond. DBS says we cannot touch diamond. Those are the open -timers. They go to Botswana. They give the government of Botswana 50% ownership of the diamond. When it comes to South Africa, the same company, owned by the same people, are refusing to do that. What does the government of Botswana do with the 50% uh, profit they make in the diamond? They invest it in the social beings of the children of Botswana. All children of Botswana, everywhere in the world, get a stipend every month. When I was in Washington, D.C., some other time in my previous life, in a wrong organization, I, I, <laughs> I happened to come across the Botswana students and I sat with them. 
at that time they were getting 5,000 rand apart from everything else being paid for. 5,000 rand. My mother went to the grave without earning 5,000 rand. Students are given 5,000 rand from minerals. The last point uh, is with regard to load shedding. We are told leave coal, go for green, go for alternative energy. We're not opposed to that. But we're not going to go for anything new without a base. Coal is our base. And when we break new ground, you can't break new ground without having a base. You consolidate your base and then you break new grounds. If green is going to give me a 1,000 megawatts, then I can go and close a coal a power station of 1,000 megawatt capacity because I've already developed an alternative of 1,000 megawatt. We are made to celebrate nonsense, but people are, through, are, are shutting down uh, power stations and then from there they don't know where to get an alternative source of energy. We can't allow that. So the same code that we must not use, we are even given money not to use it, gets into the trucks. Where does it go? Leave China because you hate it. It's going there. That's fine. But it's also going to Germany. It's also going to UK. There was a debate that UK is actually trying to revive one of its biggest coal power stations. They are, they are getting from the same coal that we have signed that we must not use it. As a result, we don't have electricity. Secondly, uh, the power stations must be security uh, national key points. So whoever works there must have a security clearance so that we will not sabotage from that strategic position. But these power stations must be serviced and maintained. The maintenance money and servicing of power stations must not go into the pockets of the people. The power station must have people who are well capacitated, qualified engineers, and even if it's cadre deployment, nothing wrong with it. It ought to be on merit. As long as you've got the proper qualification, whether you are ANC or not, get the job. There is a person there who decides that we are going to level six, stage six, stage three, stage six, stage one. It's called system control. Ask one minister of the ANC, do you know who system controller is? They don't know. They just get told we are now going to six. And they've got, they don't have the technical know-how to counter that we are not at a point where we require stage six. So you do as you are told, because we've got no state capacity to deal with such uh, issues. Those are the key issues that we believe is the EFF. If we address these issues, we'll have a proper country. There's no one here who must say to us, there must not be a state bank. Because a state bank, nationalization of banks means the state must establish its own bank. And they say, no, RMB is going to have a problem. This will lead to the RMB closure. There is a school here called Grindstein, uh, Sundown. There is a public school here called Grindstein High School. There is a school here called St. David's Private School. The public school has not led to the closure of the private school. There is a private hospital. There is a public hospital. The public hospital has never led to the closure of a private hospital. Why would the ownership of a bank, a, a, a public bank, lead to the closure of, of, of uh, the private banks? The banks are opposed to that because they are exploiting our people. We are going to establish a state-owned bank and give our people good interest rates, not driven by the need and desire to maximize profit. We must make the money, we must generate our money back, make some profit, but our people should be able to live. Our teachers, our nurses, even doctors, no, let's leave doctors, teachers, nurses, and these civil servants don't qualify for cars, don't qualify for houses. No bank wants to finance them. Doctors, highly educated, seven years, the biggest car they can drive is goal five. Goal five. That's what they qualify for. Mr. Malema, can I interrupt you there? <laughs> Are you going to bank with this bank? Are you going to put your own money? Yes. 
that's where this, the, 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 the salaries of the employees of the state are going to be paid from there. The monies of all the departments are going to be banked from there. And we are not going to use any of your money to build a state bank. We already have money in the African bank. The other day I said uh, net bank, and someone was like, I realized, oh yeah. <laughs> African bank, through the reserve bank, we have shares in African bank. So why can't we grow our shares in African bank and ultimately push everyone out and take African bank to be a state bank? Because already we are participating. Well, not, it's not going to be the first time the state participates in the bank. Why is the state being pushed away? The state is being pushed away because private financial institutions are scared of competition. They thrive through colluding. So if effectively, you saying uh, more state-owned companies participating in critical sectors of the economy. One would say, what happened to... Uh, institutions like the post office, for instance. Isn't that one of uh, state banks that could be operational? Well, the, the, the uh, post bank was one of the most alternative options uh, that we could have utilized to establish a state bank. Post office was one of the most useful institutions for us black people, especially the rural masses of our people. They, it, it, they received a lot of services uh, from post office. So when you say Technology has advanced and therefore post office has become irrelevant. It's nonsense because there are private companies now that are doing the job that post office could have done. But the corrupt, the leadership that lacks vision, the leadership that says, but making post office a bank now, how is it going to give me money now? Because those are the people of eating now. They don't have time and the patience to wait. So you need a leadership that, is, that has got vision, that will protect the state-owned enterprises and make sure they are led by men and women with the necessary capacity. And where there is corruption, those people must go to jail, irrespective of who they are. So the problem with us is that for the past 30 years, I think we only jailed uh, Tony and Gain for discount. <laughs> but with so much corruption only one name can come up corruption is one of the things that uh, collapsed state owned companies yes. what is going to be different under a coalition that you might be part of if you are uh, successful in the upcoming elections in terms of dealing with corruption we, I mean we have been talking about it for many years and different political parties have been talking about it but m nothing much has changed in a visible way. SOEs continue to be run down and we are not seeing uh, big politicians being jailed. Well, you need to professionalize the civil service. You need people like Mkwanazi, the commissioner of police in KZN, who knows that when I'm a policeman, I do police work. I'm not here to impress politicians, whether a politician likes it or not. So we need people who are professionals who are going to say, this is my responsibility, I love the country, and everybody you employ, you must give them the constitution and the flag and tell them this is what you must be loyal to. Not these other shenanigans, they are here to live. Every five years there is going to be someone, the state will remain, be loyal to the state. We need to arrest. That's the only thing, and we are going to arrest under our government. We are going to run this government, by the way, the way we are running EFF. When you come to EFF events or offices or whatever project the EFF executes, you will not find anyone running around sweating, not knowing what they are doing. Everything is orderly. Everybody knows my job is to do this from there I go home. We need leadership and decisive leadership. Okay. Can I ask Mr. President about the coalition talks? Mm -hmm. Please educate me. Have you started discussing with other parties uh, that you perhaps will marry up for the, co the coalition government? Uh, do you have a preference uh, for a coalition government? What would your terms be uh, for that uh, uh, negotiation and the ultimately the government? You know we had reached an agreement with the ANC now, even before coalition, 
to expropriate land without compensation. Put that motion in Parliament as the EFF. The motion got passed. We went all over South Africa. Majority of South Africans who made submissions, who came to public participation, said expropriate this land without compensation. The ANC, on the if of amending that constitution, developed a cold feet. Because it was coming from a conference that said expropriate the land, nationalize the Reserve Bank, create the state-owned bank. So those are the EFF conditions of expropriation of land without compensation, of industrialization and beneficiation, of fighting corruption and making education free. There is a new condition that we have put there. Every learner in South Africa is going to do mathematics and not literacy. Why? Give our children everything else the poor said we must not get. So Fairwood said, why do you give an African child mathematics? Because they will not have, they won't use it anyway. He was right. Because mathematics meant high jobs. And high jobs were reserved for whites. So you're going to learn mathematics, then what? So we ought to teach our children mathematics so that they've got the capacity to think. Mathematics helps them to expand their brain. And we don't care whether they pass it or not. Of course, we care that they pass it, but even if you don't pass, at least you did mathematics. There's no dumb gob that has done mathematics. Mathematics are for thinkers. And that's why we want our children to be thinkers. That was denied uh, from, that was denied by uh, Fairwood. ANC, instead of giving us RDP houses in 1994 and giving us food parcels and giving us all free this, they should have given us free education. 30 years now, there will not be a family that needs an RDP house. We would have built our own houses, much more beautiful houses because we'll be educated with good positions and able to pay for our own responsibilities. Mandela's problem, which he should have realized at the time, what was at the center of the oppression of our people? It was education. Apartheid was education. They said on education, separate them. What is the difference between us and Zimbabweans? Ian Smith in Zimbabwe, when he arrived, he wanted to do the same thing. But he realized he doesn't have sufficient whites to can carry that economy alone. And because he had no option, he now allowed all people of Zimbabwe, including Africans, to get same education. That's why you've got Zimbabweans being at that level, because they've never received an inferior education in their country. We're destroyed by inferior education. Okay, can I take you back to the issues of competition in, in sectors yes. of the economy? What is your idea of the role of the private sector in energy, in logistics, um, maybe even in the water sector? The private sector has got no role in the energy. I said to you, energy, uh, power stations are a national security key point. So I'm not going to entrust the future of my country in the hands of a private man called Juan Rupert, who can decide any day I'm closing my, my power station the way he closes his own kitchen. No. <laughs> the power stations and the energy cannot be in the individual rights. The same thing as water. Water is very strategic key, important issue in our economy. You cannot entrust that responsibility with an individual. That's why the manifest of the EFF says we will own strategic means of the economy. We don't just own everything, this saloon, this pass. We don't, we don't want such things. Anything strategic must be state-led, must be state-owned. Uh, if you have a problem with us operating Prasa, I'm amenable to listen to that debate, but I'm going to own the railway lane. Because trains, these locomotives, they can be replaced at any time. If you take them, I can get them somewhere and put them there. But the day you wake up crazy and you see you are taking your railway lane out because you don't like Malema, what, what alternative can I get? Because it will take me years 
to put a railway lane. Why would you entrust railway lanes in the hands of the private sector? But locomotives you can give to the private sector, there's no problem. There's a difference. I, I wouldn't think maybe entrusting entirely. I would think it's introducing competition so that the state-owned company can compete and make sure that there are efficiencies. As we sit, many SOEs have been run as monopolies, but they are failing to deliver their core mandate. That's why we are talking about the potential for, for private sector participation. Compete there, not on strategic sectors of the economy. You can compete on everything. Strategic sectors of the economy are owned by the state. Two, it's not true that South African state-owned enterprises failed. They were made to fail. Let me tell you, here in Prasa, um, they supposed they, they rent 10 locomotives for 50 million. Then, they, out of 10, they take three to go and be operational and put seven in a storeroom. Then three, at the end of the financial year, that three, obviously it can't bring us back 50 million. It brings us back 15 million. They bring that report to parliament and say, look at what we've done. We've, we've been renting this, operating these things. This thing is not making money. From 50, we only made 15. They are not telling you, we hired 10, we operated 3. Why? Make it fail so that everybody gets angry when you say, I want to privatize it. But yeah, of course. Well, how can we spend 50 million and make 15 million? They were sabotaged. They were made to fail. And at the center of that was Praveen, your former boss. Let's, let's go to online questions, there are a couple of them. The first one is, will you make any changes on personal income tax rates, value-added tax rates or corporate tax, and in particular, potential changes in mining tax and royalties? Well, uh, corporate tax, we're going to make changes because we think we're not making as much as we're supposed to make because of uh, these people who are engaged in illicit financial flows uh, people who are investing money in tax havens, and we ought to introduce tight laws, including tax avoidance. People say tax avoidance is not legal. Of course, you are, you're not, it's not illegal. Your accountancy, that's your argument to do. But we don't want tax avoidance. We want everybody to pay what they're supposed to pay here in South Africa. Why do you punish the poor by increasing VAT? We want to reduce VAT from 15% to 14% because it's too heavy on the poor. Where will you make money from? We'll make money from the illicit financial flows, from corporate tax, which we are not uh, generating sufficiently as we are supposed to be. I doubt, and, I, and, and I've, I've said to Floyd, we need to make some investigation. I doubt if the Oppenheimers pay tax. Which tax men in the SARS will dare go to the open numbers and tell them your, your taxes are due and this is a penalty, this is an interest? Who? If you value your job. Who? <laughs> Those are the people that are stealing from this country. They do as they wish and they are untouchables. They will never be under the EFF untouchables because we will not be in bed with monopoly capital that milks South Africa dry. Next question to do with municipalities. Yes. That we know a lot of them are under financial strain. It says, um, if you come into a coalition, what would you do to assist municipalities? We must make a infrastructural fund available to municipalities. And why should the municipalities apply for such a fund? Because as a national government, we must know where are the problems. There are certain municipalities that have got no source of income, even if you want to generate money from electricity, from water, from, they are rural municipalities, they've got no such capacity. Why can't we take the money and go and help them, including taking treasury people who are over-celebrated, to go and manage that money directly in the municipality to ensure that infrastructure is developed. Once you put 
piped water in the houses of our people, you put electricity, you put tarots, and all the basic services, there is no way they will refuse to pay worse if you industrialize as well in those uh, municipalities. But the EFF does not want provincial governments. So we don't want premiers. Premier for what? All of you who sit here in RMB, one day just sit alone and ask yourself, what is the role of a premier mar? Like, what does the premier do? Like, what is the role of an MEC? What do they do? What does the MEC of education do? Because the curriculum is determined up there. We are all going to receive the curriculum from national government. And we are all going to write the national certificate. There is no Limpopo vendor certificate. There is a national certificate. So what becomes the role of these people? My counselor is more useful than the premier. Because if there is a sewer blockage, I can call him. He comes to the site of the sewer blockage, call the municipal workers from there to ask them to come and unblock the sewer. Uh, uh, the sewer. No single premier can unblock even a sewer. No premier can patch a pothole or MEC. These things are put there for political patronage of creating positions for each other without any meaning. They must be scrapped. Why do you have deputy ministers? What role does a deputy minister play? Seated in this hall, you are the cream de la cream of our country. But if I were to randomly ask you, who is a deputy minister of agriculture? You are going to look at me like, is there something like that? <laughs> Yet you are the most educated. I'm not talking to the illiterate. These people are getting so much money from you, but have got no role to play patronage. Why do you need minister of higher education and then another one of science and technology? What is higher education? Higher education is university and TVS. And science and technology is innovation and research. So innovation and research is the role of a university. So why do you separate this? It's one thing. You're separating it because you are trying to create as many jobs as possible for your supporters and not just supporters, people who are in your faction. So essentially, it's streamlining government into two tiers, national and, and, and local government. Houting must be a super metro with so many councillors with one mayor. Why mayor? The mayor can unblock a sewer. Look at that. There's this provincial legislatures. Provincial, they don't meet. Why? Because they don't know they're meeting and then do what? They don't meet. They don't do anything. When they meet, it's, it's a public announcement. Everybody knows. Legislature is going to meet today because it doesn't happen more often. In parliament, we meet every day. Every day, including weekend. And when they say parliament is on recess, members of parliament are not on recess, are sent to do constituency work. Recess means constituency work. So we're working. Can you say the same about legislature? The answer is no. What do we need this for? Why are we making, paying so much for an institution that is irrelevant? Legislature is supposed to make the law. Why should there be a law of Limpopo and be a law of Cape Town when we are under one progressive constitution? Because every law we pass must be in line with the constitution. So we don't need any other law. One law for all of us. When they say the clubs are closing at 4 a.m. in Cape Town, it must be the same thing in Limpopo. Why should there be a separate law of Limpopo? How does this alcohol get people drunk? The ones of Cape Town, they get much better drunk, and this one gets them more drunk. That's why they must sleep ill. What, in, what is the rationale behind having this kind of two different, three, nine separate uh, legislation? It's unacceptable. It's waste of money. Could you give us a sense, uh, Mr. Malema, of your reading of the lay of the land? I would imagine you do some uh, surveys. Uh, where is the EFF? Where is the ANC DA in your reading? Could you share a bit about how you get that number? Well, we sit in between 28 and 30%. We have passed the DA, and that's why the DA, most of you, you may not even know, why did the DA declare the EFF enemy number one? 
I mean, we are running a race here. We are three. There is number one there. You are number two. I'm number three. What type of madness is that for you to turn and look at number three instead of fighting with number one for you to become number one? So you can see that their research told them you've got a problem. You are being overtaken by this one. So you may not get number one, but you are also going to lose your position. So block this one. So you don't need any scientific reading to arrive at the conclusion that the real threat to the DA is the EFF. And the ANC is sitting between 38 and 40 percent. Because ANC rules Houting now with 50.1, which they got in 2019. Then they rule KZN. Then they lost Western Cape. That's how they managed to get 57 percent. If you lose KZN, you lose Western Cape, you lose Houting, and hope to get 50 percent nationally. Numbers don't tally. Okay. So, we, we, as far as we are concerned, that's where we are. There is a new phenomenon called MK Party. We think it will have an impact in KZN. Could you expand on that? Well, President Zuma, when he was president of the ANC, declined the ANC support everywhere and only increased it in KZN. And when he lost the presidency, the ANC declined everywhere, including in KZN. But it has never declined under Zuma. So President Zuma enjoys a lot of support from KZN. And that's where we think it's going to have an impact. And even when you look at his strategy, he doesn't do what we do. I'm, Saturday I'm in Northwest, Sunday I'm in Free State, Thursday I'm in East London. Because we are a national organization. We are not a, some organization that relies on some base somewhere. So, if MK eat, the ANC were going to eat it proper even without MK in KZN. Now imagine with added MK, if the ANC loses that number in KZN significantly, forget. And let me tell you, Cyril won't be president once the ANC goes below 50%. He's going to resign because his own so-called supporters are going to say, we need to try someone else. So don't even ask me, okay, will you go with Cyril into coalition? Once there is a need for coalition, then you must know there is a need for Cyril to go. And it will not be initiated by the EFF. His own party is going to say, my guy, we need to try someone else. That, that's how it works. Ruling parties, once they lose position under your leadership, they are the ones who tell her, put it down. How will that happen given that we are still the president of the ruling party until the next conference? But Cyril resigned when Palapala a panel report came. He resigned. So you have a president who is there by the body, but the soul is gone. Because <laughs> when, when you write a letter of resignation, you had a conversation with yourself and came to a conclusion. He has long come to that determination. And not only that letter, on several occasions, in the officials of the ANC has been telling them, I've been ready to leave, I can leave at any time. And I hear that investors love him so much and all of that, but you are likely to invest in a wrong horse this time around. Because I don't think that given the things that uh, are happening now, President Ramaphosa stands a chance to come back. They will tell him, when they say resign, they don't mean government. They mean ANC, resign as a president of the ANC. Once you do that, automatically on the other side is done. Who in your mind is likely to come? It's their own problem. Don't ask me about people of <laughs> next door. I don't choose leaders for the ANC. Ask me about EFF and how but we're you going know. to do it. I don't know. You always know. <laughs> No. I don't know. <laughs> it's their own problem. Let me leave it to them uh, to solve it. But we cannot determine uh, who becomes a leader of the ANC. But we can determine who becomes a leader 
of South Africa during the negotiations of a coalition. Tell me I'm wrong here. In my reading of the scenarios, yeah. an ANC EFF coalition would cause market jitters. Business wouldn't be comfortable with that idea. Am I wrong? Do you ever think about it? Do you ever think about how you manage how the markets perceive you? In the city where you are, where the market are housed, Johannesburg, that city is under a coalition arrangement of the EFF and the ANC. Why are the markets not jittery? So don't use the markets to scare us. And I know what the market means. It's a synonym for white people. You say markets this, markets that. You, are, you effectively mean white people will not be comfortable about that. Who said we're in a business of making them comfortable? <laughs> we are in a business of making the uncomfortable comfortable. And the comfortable uncomfortable. And when you say the, the uncomfortable the comfortable are not comfortable with you, I'm very happy. I'm not in a business of pleasing my oppressor. I'm in a business of pleasing the oppressed. So markets, anyway, markets don't have a problem. Markets buy diamond, blood <coughs> diamond, in a country that is characterized by war. And they even sponsor that war to make that country unstable so that they can extract as much resources as possible and make more money. Don't talk about markets as if it's, as if it's some moral people. No. They are the most immoral people. They can do anything for profit. Look, we haven't argued with any of the things you have said because this platform is really about listening to you. You can argue. No, no, no. Uh, we can argue till the cows come home. <laughs> No, we're not going to do that, but we want to hear you. Yeah. Uh, this is what uh, this uh, platform... Going back to the market's question, yeah. uh, again, I, I want to get into your head a little bit. Mm -hmm. When the rent uh, moves to 19, 20, 21, uh, whether or not we agree why and the fundamentals around mm -hmm. the political analysis mm -hmm. you gave mm -hmm. is a separate issue. Mm -hmm. There's a pragmatic, a practical issue as well, where a, a government is formed, does it bother you? This is the reality of the situation that the rand might lose a little bit. Does it practically now? Well, How about your politics? Well, uh, our currency is uh, based on the strength of the dollar. So what you do is, if the West and America and UK are not comfortable with what you stand for, you look, you look for alternative markets. As long as your reserves look good, and there is infrastructural development, there is safety and security, there is a lowered levels of corruption, if not stopping it at all. Markets will look at that and say, okay, I may not like the color red, but is the country functional? And if the country is functional, they will be able to come and invest their money here. No one wants to come and put money in a country where tomorrow you are told some army general from today owns that place. No. The constitution is there. The independence of the judiciary is there. There is a funded infrastructural development in South Africa. The roads are in good conditions. The airports and the ports are in good condition. And there is professionalism in public service. And more money is being made and reserves are looking good and you are servicing the dead. Why would the markets have a problem with who's ruling? Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can come here along that, that, uh, that line of thought, Sam. Your foreign policy views in general, your, your, your thinking about South Africa's relationship with uh, the West relative to, to the likes of China, yeah. what's your thoughts there? Well, we are an, a progressive internationalist movement that aligns with the left movement all over the world. So we find comfort in China, we find comfort in Cuba, in Vietnam, we find some comfort in Russia. We don't believe in the a big brother mentality of the USA. We think that imperialism, wherever it raises its ugly head, must be dealt with in a manner that allows people to participate in the geopolitics as equals. So uh, we are not the kind to bow to the superpowers. 
We are the ones who say to the superpowers, we are ready to work with you, but we are going to work on our terms and we'll put our country first. And not what the UK want, not what America want. It, it will come with a pain, but eventually, one day, we'll realize our true freedom. Good things come through a painful process. I'm not a mother. The mothers will tell you that during labor, it's very painful. But once the child is delivered, we forget all of the pain because a beautiful thing came out of this pain. Would you want South Africa to go through what Zimbabwe is going through? Zimbabwe went through what they went through because they used the army to want to resolve a political and economic situation. We'll never go through that. We're going through it through the constitution, not militarily, not through a, a, a beating up of white people, not through saying white people must leave their farms and all of that. No. That strategy, we don't agree with it. We want all of this to be delivered without a drop of blood. The EFF is not an anti-white uh, organization. It's anti-white monopoly capital organization. There are poor whites who stay in squatter camps who hate EFF because they say EFF is going to take our land. Like which land do you have? <laughs> Your views on NHI before said comes in? Well, uh, we, we support it. We need the primary health to be really um, uh, provided and protected and without being exploited by the private sector. The problem with what we have been subjected to now, including all of us who are seated here who've got medical aid, the problem is not the doctors. The problem is these hospitals who are charging crazy amounts of money to, uh, uh, for a patient to be attended to in their hospitals. So that intervention helps our people to have universal access to health because health is a precious thing and is good for our economy. We need to look after the health of our people and that should not be treated as a commodity. Okay. Am I picking up an, a new emphasis here mm. uh, in the articulation of where the EFF is that the, the land issue gets resolved through the constitution. Mm. Uh, is it a particular emphasis from you? The EFF is not anti-white? Right. Is it something I've, been, I've missed before? But also yeah. even in terms of the nationalization, yeah. um, if I listened, if I heard properly, yeah. it's not necessarily taking over existing institutions. Absolutely. It's building government-run institutions to compete. Uh, you're right. right, you're right. At least I'm sitting with people who are listening. You, you, you're, you're, you're following what uh, I'm saying. You're not here to compete with me and come across as being smart. You, you, try, you try to uh, absorb as much information as possible from the EFF uh, uh, manifesto. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a new emphasis. Um, it is in the founding manifesto of the EFF. All of this that I'm saying, someone decided to create a swar khafar that you must be scared of these black people that are coming from um, uh, EFF. My wife worked here, by the way, at RMB 5. One day we did a march here, and she arrived at work here at RMB. She got a letter that you must knock off at 10 o'clock, the EFF is coming, close all the offices, and they all got released, and when she came back, she was like, baby, we got letters like, some warlords are going to be marching into something and then our security is being threatened. We never said that. We never issued that letter. It was issued by our enemies to create Swar Khafar. They always distort an EFF message deliberately. Why? The EFF breeds black people who are not scared of a white man, who see a white person as a human being. I don't know where I get this, but there's no white person who can say some wrong thing, even when they say it through some innuendo, and I don't pick up that here we're being patronized. And this patronage must be taken head on. We need to breed the kind of blacks, especially black professionals, who are going to say, 
She's not going to get promotion on the basis of her color. I've been here. I've got these qualifications. I've got this experience. Where's I've trained her? But you've got blacks who train white kids. And then white kids got promoted before them. And they are helpless. They can't talk about it. And then when Malema speaks about it, they clap hands at home. When they come here, they're like, mm, we don't understand this guy. <laughs> Maybe we can take a couple of questions from the audience if there's anyone that has a burning question before we go back to online. Can I have water? Uh, I'm not going to open this. No. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You can. Thank you. Tobela, Tobela, Tobela. Just a quick question on, on the matter of transformation <laughs> and human capital development. We've got massive youth unemployment. <laughs> What, what's your plan to develop that? Because a lot of experts are saying they are unemployed and they are unemployed. So what's the plan to develop young blacks that are sitting at home to come to cooperate, transform? Yeah. Well, our youth is not entirely correct that it's not employable. There are so many of them who are qualified and um, jobs are not available for them. That's why they always say, no, Zimbabweans are taking our jobs. I'm like, I can put these Zimbabweans, all of them in a bus now, and take them back to Zimbabwe. You will still be unemployed. Because these positions that you are qualified for are not necessarily the ones that Zimbabweans are taking from you. So Zimbabweans are taking those kind of jobs there in the farms, in in the domestic which you don't want to do because you are qualified the issue is to make sure that we re-industrialize and incorporate these young people in those industries we benefit incorporate them uh, into those uh, institutions why is there no institution of higher learning in Khrobalazdal uh, which is relevant to the mining sector in Khrobalazdan. So that when these kids are learning mining, six months before they conclude their course, they are taken to practicals into the mining sector and they get exposure. And the bosses also get exposure to these children. By the time you graduate, they've already seen you that when whatever happens, you are coming back here. They don't know us. And they listen to stories that we don't have capacity, we're incapable, we're lazy, we can't do work. So it's not entirely correct. But equally, a country that has not been turned into a construction site, it will never create jobs. The, the infrastructure is collapsing. You can see it in front of your eyes. But there's nothing in the pipeline to build new infrastructure or to redo the existing infrastructure. These bridges that we drive on, not here in Sante, in Johannesburg, they were built that time. What happens? The people who are in now don't know. They never ask for the engineering reports of those bridges. What is the lifespan? When were they built? Uh, when are they coming to an end? They wait for a bridge to start shaking like this before they know you. Oh, this bridge is a. Why is it shaking? What's wrong? But it has finished its lifespan. That's why it's, it's shaking. So we need to skill our youth with what is relevant to them. Platinum in Rustenburg. This Vets University was built by mining companies, the Oppenheimers in particular, because of the discovery of gold. It's one of the best. A mining engineering university in the whole world. Why did it, it come about? It came about because of gold. Why is platinum not doing the same in Rustenburg? Why is coal not doing the same in Le Palan? So our youth skills must be directed to what is relevant to the economy and companies that are agreeing to go and open industries in those areas and give jobs to our people, they must have some incentives. There's no person who can say, and oh, no, I will not open a, a factory there when we say, come, we give you free water, we give you free electricity, on condition we employ 2,000 young people from this area. They say, what? 
I'm coming there because there are incentives or even tax incentives if you want for people who go and industrialize and revive the economies of the towns that do not have uh, any economic activity. Okay, we're coming close to the end of the conversation. One more question. Uh, anyone with a burning question before we close it up? Gentlemen there? Wow. Um, I think this will come as a comment and, and a question. So uh, I try to convince people to vote for EFF. Yeah. <laughs> for, for particular reasons. Yeah. So that just in case. Uh, to be like ANC one day, I'm like, I have yeah, yeah, member, I can yeah, for some yeah. But my point is, where I struggle is the nationalization of land. Mm -hmm. So I think, for me, I'm missing something is so currently, if they say I come to a bank and I'm going to borrow some money, and then I can say, I have a land, or I have a house, I have a house, then maybe we can make it collateral and so on. Mm -hmm. If the land is owned by state, then what happens in those kind of scenarios? Your collateral is your house. You cannot give a collateral you don't have. Your house is a collateral, it will be of value. That's why what is expensive now is the prime land. They say prime land, prime land, to deny us access to that land. So this building is worth something without the land. And they know how best they can even make it more profitable out of these things that are on top uh, of the land. In China, no one owns a piece of land. But China has never declined economically. It has been one of the growing economies. But where white people live, not wise, African farmers are now leaving South Africa because they say our land is going to be taken and then they go to Mozambique where they are not allowed to buy. They lease. But they are prepared to lease in Mozambique but refuse to lease from the state here in South Africa. All we are saying, guys, is the only way, the quickest way to give you the land is to get the land into the state first, then get the state to redistribute the land equally to everyone. Then we can come back and say, perhaps we must now reconsider certain portions of the land to be in the hands of individuals. But as an immediate intervention, because of 30 years of democracy, there must be something that is done with regard to the land. Our struggle has been about the land. From inception, it has never been about voting. It has never been about BEE. If you owned the land, you were not going to be a BEE partner. You are a partner to the owners of the land. People will be partnering you because you have the land. We ought to, painful as it might be, we ought to reverse this. The dignity of an African child can only be restored when we give them back that which belongs to them. Yeah, I, I wanted to close the conversation now, but I think this question is absolutely <laughs> crucial. So I'm going to sneak it in. Okay. If you can answer in about 30 seconds. Your view on women leadership, and particularly within the EFF and even at a national level. You know, I come across as very this strong character with a strong presence and uh, who is driven by masculinity and all of that. But I grew up without a father. I was brought up by three women in my life. My mother was epileptic. Because of epilepsy, she couldn't stay in her own house. She stayed with my grandmother. Then my grandmother took over. Then Winnie Mandela. So I don't talk about women leadership in theory. I've seen what women can do. I've seen what women can produce. So, women leadership should never even be a question that gets to be asked as if we're patronizing or doing women a favor. We must talk about leadership. And in leadership, we know is both male and females and others. Because these days, gender agrees beyond male, female, others. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Malema, for an exciting There was a lady with a hand. There's no lady who asked the question. Oh, okay. And then okay. You, you, no, but you ask me a woman question and then you don't recognize women. <laughs> There's a question. There's a question. You are recognized. Oh, thank you for recognizing me. I'm quite passionate about female leadership. Yes. So it's good to know that you subscribe to such. So my question is really an extension.
question of, of the lunch discussion. Maybe that's why I decided to yes. put my hand up. So when you talk about taking back the land, where there's already buildings and developments, right? Back into leasehold, I guess, by government. How does the government then beneficiate? So I understand where land is not yet distributed, then it can redistribute to, to, to the popula population. So how does it then benefit from land that is already, sort of, you're taking it back? Is it in the form of levies or, like, how does, yeah? Well, the government does not make anyone pay for the land, rich or poor, but the land must be used. And because the usage of land, it means jobs, it means economic development, it means benefits to the state, because in the absence of the land being used, then the state doesn't, have to, doesn't make money. So you can't pay yourself, because you are the state. This is you. This is your land. Let's go and make use of it. In the developed areas, by the way, um, uh, let's say Johannesburg. Yes, yes. If you were to go around and find so much dilapidated, unused buildings, Johannesburg, maybe you like, yeah, the city. Let's go to Sunday's day where we are told there is no piece of land. Go to each and every street. There is no way you will not find hectares and hectares of abundant land in Sunday itself. So you're thinking, ah, they're going to take rural land. They will not have access to this land here. There's a lot of it. Unaccounted for. Some is estate. Some disappeared when they were running away from Mandela. That we can't be led by a prisoner, black. We live in South Africa and they regretted why they left. Because that was a big mistake they made. So, all of this land will be used to benefit our people and the economy of South Africa. Agricultural land also is very important. Because, do you know that a lot of people have fenced arable land and they call it game farm. And when you go inside there, there is no game. Not even uh, impala. There's absolutely nothing. Where is the owner of the land? It's in UK. Where I come from, and this I say in public, you are a journalist who can go. In my township, there used to be a big farm. We used, when we were growing up, we were scared of that white man. And we never played next to his farm. We went to occupy that farm uh, with the, my branch. We said, we can't say to people, they must take the land. You don't take it. Let's take this one. The first thing we did was to remove the fence and waited for three months to wait for a reaction. <laughs> and then there was no reaction. And then we went in to cut sites for our brothers and sisters who were staying in the back rooms. We housed, as I speak now, 3,000 families. The owners of the land showed up and said, no, we want to talk to Mr. Malema. Some black guy comes to talk to me. They are like, Let me see them. I'm happy to see them. They said, no, this is our father's land, and uh, he left it, he died, he left it with us, and all of that. Okay, what are you doing with this land? Because you don't stay here, and you have a piece of land, and you don't do anything with it. I know, we're going to do middle income housing, we're just working on the plans. No, you're going to give us half of this. And then you can do middle income houses there, and you have five years to do middle income houses there. Otherwise, we're getting in there as well. Then we further agreed that they will put sewer, they will put electricity, they will put water where we occupied as their way of paying back to the community. I'm saying to you, there's too much of land that people died and left and their children are counting it as part of their assets. They don't even know where that place is and how that place looks like. Look, once we say the state has taken over the land, please, everybody, the owner of the land, must come and redeclare the portion of the land you are occupying and what you are using it for. You are going to be shocked that there are no owners. The last point on the land, there was a road which was built from Rastimbek to Mafike. Those who are from Northwest will know that. They were expanding the road during the time of Tandimudis. So when they were expanding the land, the, the road, they had to cut some pieces of land from the farms so that they can expand the road. 
But because the ANC policy says uh, you have to compensate, they are expropriating is allowed, but you have to compensate. They called the Boers and said, the owners of the farms, said, come, tell us how much is your portion, bring the title deed, then we pay you. They said, eh, 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 eh. that's our donation, that's our contribution to the land. Why? They have got no title deeds of the farms they are occupying now. They have got no papers. They will never come back to the state and say, I'm so and so, I occupy this piece of land and therefore I want to continue with it. Because when you say you are occupying it, you have to produce a proof. This, uh, the days have been occupying it. And, and, and they gave each other farms on the eve of 1994. They said, these guys are coming. We now have to push these things to our sides. There's an EFF guy in um, Midvan who went to occupy half of an existing farm. And a farmer came, white man said, if you don't live here, I'm going to shoot you. He said, no, I'm not living here. This is not your land. The guy argued with our guy. We said to him, buy fence and fence that portion. He bought a fence, fence the portion. They are now neighbors with the white man. You know why? The white man does not have papers for that land. So how, I asked this guy, how did you know this guy didn't have papers? says, the, the community gossips about it that this was a government farm. And then this guy occupied it just before 1994. He has got no papers. There are a lot of them like that. And that land can be found and must be used for the benefit of our economy and our people. Thank you. Thank you very much. For... Do you have more questions? Like no, that? no more when questions. When is he coming back uh, yeah. to RMB for Melting Pot? Yeah. Is he coming back as finance minister, deputy president? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go inside. Thank you very if much. You can answer it on yeah. your yeah. way out. If you are at liberty to answer, you can your way out. quickly. No, I'm can. going to come back as Julius Malema. It doesn't matter which title I occupy, but you can be rest assured that after this election, I will be playing an important role in this government. Deputy President? Leave that to uh, 29 May. Why do you choose Deputy President? You are undermining me. <laughs> Why are you not choosing President? Thank you very much.